I just uh, wanted to say something about uh, the, um, you know, we had the one question about the, about the attributes, about using the dimension key twice. And um, um, I actually don't have, um, um, uh, I, I don't have the solution to that lab uh, set up on, on my computer right now. But uh, I, I think I can do it from here. What, what I'm showing here is, is the, the attribute lattice view of attribute relationships that's available using a, a tool from the um, CodePlex called uh, the Bids Helper. The Bids Helper adds a lot of special tools for working with dimensions and aggregations and so forth. And one of them is this, this kind of nice visual view of how all your attributes are rela related to each other. So, I mean, again, it's very easy to use. Download it from CodePlex, the Bids Helper, install it, and you get all these different menu options popping up in the bids. It should have been there in the first place, but they weren't. Um, anyway, this shows a particular dimension I was working with, and um, there's actually a bunch of other um, attributes here. And again, almost all of them are related right to the... Um, to the dimension attribute. We just have this one single hierarchy on um, uh, kind of a customer geography. But uh, so what I did to enable this cube to process, and this cube would not process the way it is now with 11 million members, but, and then we're using six gigabytes of RAM. Uh, it, it wouldn't process because it, it just ran out of memory. It, it ran out of memory and then the processing just uh, stopped. Uh, and it got, an, well, it got an out of memory error. So what I did is I took the, uh, the customer name, or actually the customer ID, added it in a separate time, and related half the attributes to the second time, to the second instance of it, and related that one back to the customer ID. That way, um, half the attributes got processed together with the key one time, and then the others got processed the second time. Now, the only thing that, you know, obvious about that is it changes the user experience in one way. And that is, is that any, of course, this, this, the second instance of the customer ID was, uh, of course, it was made invisible. You don't want to see the customer twice. Um, and so any attributes related to the hidden version would not show up as member properties in the interface. I mean, they work fine as regular attributes, but they wouldn't show up as member properties. So uh, anyway, that's uh, one, one possible way to solve the attribute. Does, does that kind of make sense? Yeah. yeah, okay, okay, good, good. Okay, where were we? Um, let's see. Larger cubes require simpler structures. Went over that. And then uh, this next section, Never or almost never use these features. Here's one of the other themes in our course. And, and now we're talking about, uh, you know, if, if we had to look at this slide, this is for larger cubes. Be careful about all these features. This slide is you maybe never want to or almost never want to use these things. Uh, proactive caching, uh, linked measure groups and remote partitions. You know, linked measure groups and remote partitions were kind of a way that Microsoft tried to put into the product a business of uh, uh, spreading out the work of the server over multiple servers. But uh, they never work very well, they're hard to administer, and they don't work very well with performance. And so what Microsoft recommends now is they do scaling out. You know, if you need to spread over multiple servers, don't use link measure groups, don't use remote partitions. They're there in the product, but they just don't work very well. And so the recommendation is to use scaling out. Uh, lazy processing, again, is a way of making processing, getting processing done quicker, and so then you finish up processing uh, you know, when the server has time to do the processing. Um, Experience of the SQL CAT team, There's a, lot of, a lot of users had a lot of trouble with that. Much better to get the processing done and, um, and not use lazy processing. Parent-child dimensions, again, I already talked about this with the large cubes. 
Um, and, and if there's one of the things that really surprised me in working on this, this course the last three weeks, it was this a strong recommendation coming out of the SQL CAT team to not use parent-child dimensions or to use them very sparingly, only if they were really quite small. And again, the question is, do you ever really need to use it? Uh, can you change them into a regular dimension? And then finally, name sets. Um, that also kind of surprised me, but uh, uh, name sets will often disable block calculation. Um, in, in SQL Server 2008, or the change from 2005 to 2008, queries are able to use what's called block calculation much more often, and actually we'll be, be talking about that a little later. Uh, the queries go faster, but name sets, uh, using sets in general, will often disable block calculation and the queries will take a lot longer. But the other thing about name sets, name sets of course are defined in the MDX script and they are initialized, they're reloaded, they're calculated every time uh, the cache is dumped, the analysis server cache is dumped. And um, so anytime you process a cube, um, they have to be recalculated or anytime you clear the cache. Now, of course, most people don't clear a cache unless, we're, unless you're um, um, you know, testing queries. But uh, if, I mean, I've seen situations where it took four minutes to evaluate all the name sets. So the first query of any type that anybody ran after queue processing took four extra minutes to come back. And so, you know, that's just, a, uh, it's, it's a performance problem. So, um, um, I heard one of the Microsoft developers say, I wish we had never put name sets into the system. You know, I wish we'd never done that. But, you know, obviously they're, they're useful. You know, and so, I mean, that's why they're there. Uh, on small cubes, as long as they're not a problem, that's great. Go ahead and use the name sets. But uh, on larger cubes, situations, they can be a problem. Okay, another topic. We had a whole module on this topic. Can you consider using Rolap? Right now, people would only use Rolap if they're using real-time, uh, uh, re using real-time OLAP, that they have some partitions that have to have absolutely the current data. Uh, but Microsoft, or the SQL CAT team, published a study last summer on, uh, on using Rolap. Uh, very interesting results. Rolap worked much better than I thought it would work, and a lot of people thought it would work. And it's really an important, especially as we come forward with the parallel data warehouse and the columnar, uh, columnar databases that are coming, the columnar indexes. Um, I expect Rolap will be a, a, a technique that will be used much more going on into the future. Uh, using it now, well, probably not, unless you're trying to do real-time OLAP because there are several things about it. There are some, there's this, this white, white paper, very interesting white paper, uh, kind of some very specialized techniques, different ways of using aggregations with it, and, um, but there are a lot of limitations to it. You have to design your cube in a certain way if you're gonna use uh, Rolap. Uh, this is directly out of their study. They actually found a bunch of, some of the queries uh, perform faster using Rolap, uh, though some of them did perform slower, and um, uh, some, you know, some a lot faster. Uh, but this is, again, this is comparing the Rolap with the same structure using Molap. Uh, some of them were 10 plus times faster, a lot of them were 2 to 10 times faster, some were moderately faster, some were moderately slower, 2 to 10 times slower, there are quite a few of those, and some way slower. So. It, uh, but, but even so, for those of us who have worked with this for a long time, Rolap has never really worked very well. In fact, it's worked pretty poorly, but using the right strategies, it, uh, it's a possibility now. And I have a slide here, that, again, that just shows the details of the queries. Um, what is it? The red is, uh, red is Molap, the blue is Rolap, and on a logarithmic scale, you know, some of, them, some of them come in a lot, a lot shorter, some of them come in longer. 
I'm going through some of these slides quite quickly, but these, these are going to be posted on the user group site. They maybe already are, are they? You're not yet? No, I don't think so. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I gave them to, uh, uh, to Johan, and he's, he said he was going to get them posted. So uh, if you want to see some of those in more detail. Okay, that brings me to the third topic that I have, and that is the, the quick recommendations. And again, these were just things that jumped out at me as I went through the course. And as I saw other people being surprised by them and saying, oh, well, there's something, you know. So, I mean, for those of you who are you're working with analysis services, you want a few ideas of things you can try, uh, here's, here's a list of them. Uh, first of all, switching to uh, multi-user configuration. Um, out of the box, um, my, uh, the analysis server is configured to use its own heap rather than using the Windows heap. And um, this works better if you have five or fewer concurrent users. If you have five users or less sending queries to the analysis server at the same time. But if you have more than that, uh, the analysis server heap does not work very well. And uh, in fact, uh, again, what I hear from the SQL Cat team, from Thomas Kaiser, is that he says the first thing that he does when he's called in on a project is he says, check these two values. If they're set at the default configuration, the way it comes out of the box, change them. Very first thing on every, any kind of performance optimization, change those two values. Switch over, and this, and this switches it to the Windows heap, and they see performance in sometimes increasing, uh, or the, the length of the queries being dropped in half. You know, tremendous improvement just from making this change. And of course, the question is, why does analysis services, why is the analysis server configured out of the box to work best with five or fewer users? And that's, that's kind of a hard question to answer. Just, uh, yes? It's, it's up already, the slides. It's up on the site. So. It is up on the site already. Okay, good. So you, you've got the slides. So again, yeah, you don't have to write, try to write down all these details about what to change it to. You can just, if you, if you want to go ahead and follow that recommendation. Um, you know, in um, any time you do configuration with analysis services, obviously it's important to test before and after. And, you know, Anytime you make a new aggregation, you test before and after. Did this aggregation really help? But uh, this is a recommendation that, again, the, the SQL CAT team is, is pretty strong about. Just go ahead and do it. It's almost always better if you have more than five users. OK, next, uh, next topic, clearing the file system cache when optimizing. Um, If, you, if you've done any performance testing with queries with analysis services, you know that it makes a, a huge difference whether or not you run your queries on a warm cache or on a cold cache. Analysis services performs much better if the data is in cache. And um, let's see, I have, I have an example of that here. I've got a query that is... Um, Let's see. I've got a query that's retrieving uh, data from this a cube called Weekly Partitions. This is in the a real warehouse sample database. We took the real warehouse sample database that's available from Microsoft. Uh, we expanded some of the dimension, one of the dimensions, and one of the fact tables 50 times, so we could have a not a large cube but a reasonably sized cube. And um, now if I go ahead and I run this query. Selecting out of this, uh, uh, you know, this is a fact table with, um, what is it, 44, 44 million rows. So I run this query, and the result, it reports that it came back in one second. The query actually, it took the analysis server probably about a tenth of a second to come back with this data. Well, that's actually because it was on a, a warm cache. You know, it was, the cache was already warmed up. I, I'd run this query previously, 
if I, uh, um, let's see, if I go then and say, you know, this is a typical batch statement that will clear the cache for the real, the real warehouse database. So I, I run that and I clear the cache and I come back to the same query and run it again. What we expect is, you know, depending on, it can take a lot longer. And of course it did. Instead of a tenth of a second, it took um, 10 seconds. So uh, it really, it increased in speed about some, um, about, about a hundred times, you know, when I had cleared the cache, so I didn't have a, now, but, and, and I've known about this, and most analysis server folks know about this for a long time. What a lot of analysis services people are not aware of is that it also makes a big difference whether the Windows file system cache is cleared when you run an analysis server query. Because when you run a query, what the analysis server engine does is it looks in its cache. It says, have I seen something that looks like this before? And if it has, it's got it stored there. So it says, okay, here it is. We'll give you back the results very, very quickly. If it's not there, it has to go to the disk to get the information either to an aggregation or to the partition data directly. But if that partition data or that aggregation is already in the file system cache, it doesn't really go to the disk. We think of it as going to the disk, but it's not really the disk. The Windows already has it in memory. And that is much, much quicker than if it has to actually go back to the disk and get it. Now, up until about two or three months ago, the only way to effectively clear the file system cache was to turn off Windows and turn it back on. But uh, Greg Galloway um, one of the, uh, has, has wrote a, a, a store procedure called, uh, well, this, this command, clear all caches. Again, this is available on CodePlex, the analysis service store procedures. If I run this command to clear all caches, um, and then come back and run the query again. Now the file system cache is cleared. And instead of this query taking 10 seconds, it's going to um, take quite a bit longer. Now, wh why is this important? Well, it, it's, it's, it's very important. If you have users who are saying, why did this query take 10 minutes? And then you test the query, and because you have a warm file system cache, it's only taking, you know, only taking a minute for you. So when, when you work with analysis services, when you're doing performance testing on the queries, you need to look at, a, a, using the warm cache, you know, because your users maybe will have a warm cache. With a warm cache, so you do need to have warm cache, warm analysis service cache, of course, then with a warm file system cache. Secondly, with a cold analysis server cache, but a warm file system cache. Thirdly, with both caches being cold, because your users may run into that situation. And if they do, they're going to uh, see bad performance. And here it is, one minute and two seconds. So from a tenth of a second to 10 seconds to 62 seconds, depending on how you test the query. And when you try to optimize that query, it's going to make a big difference. You know, this was, this is really interesting information for me to see this because over the years in testing analysis server queries, I've seen this happening. I've cleared the cache and sometimes I get good results, sometimes I get not as good results. And um, finally, somebody's got this all figured out and, um, and it's going to really help us in our testing queries. Uh, going on to the future. Next topic, uh, or actually it's kind of two topics I threw together on the same slide, but there, there's some relationship to each other. Uh, the flight recorder, a built-in uh, monitoring tool in analysis services, turned on by default. The SQL Cat team says turn it off. You know, this gives you the last little bit of information in case your server crashes. But hopefully your analysis server doesn't crash very often. Uh, some people, it actually does crash kind of often. But for most of us, it doesn't. 
If you're not having a problem with analysis server crashing, turn it off. It's not a huge difference, but it can be significant. It's a, a small but significant performance difference just because this takes resources that don't have to be used. Very easy to turn it off. Turn it back on when you need it. If you have a crash, turn it back on. Secondly, other topic here, the resource monitor, a new CodePlex tool, it was, uh, went out on CodePlex last August, that can be useful for monitoring. Now, most people when they monitor analysis server, they use the profiler and they use the performance monitor. Those are the two standard tools. There are, there are some third-party tools which, are, um, which I've heard are very good. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't used them, but I've, I have some friends that really like some of the third-party tools, so please, you know, please do consider them. Uh, but here on, on CodePlex, there's a new tool called uh, the Resource Monitor, which uh, is really quite easy to use. It's just a, you know, a create database statement. And um, let's see, here I've got it. Um, I've got the cube opened up here. And I, want, I want to show the performance monitor values. I've got uh, the performance counter value. And I've got, uh, let's see, the perfmon. Put that on my rows. And I also need to put time in here. I'm going to put time up on the columns. What you do with this is you do a process add that uses the, um, um, it uses the, the queries, the, the dynamic, the, the, the views, the dynamic management views to get information out of uh, you know, the performance, performance counters. And it stores these view, views, values in this, uh, in this cube. So that, uh, and of course it doesn't, they don't aggregate very well. In fact, they aggregate absolutely terribly. But if you open up to the details, you can see that this is the amount of memory usage at this particular time, and this is the amount of memory usage at that time, at that time, and so forth. And get all the different types of uh, counters. And um, so you could run this. You could run this process statement, which is available from CodePlex. You could run it once every hour, once every day, whatever. And you could keep a very easy record that then you can go in and browse the performance of your cubes. Do it with uh, all these different counters. And um, um, the, the other one that's, that's really interesting is to do it with, uh, with memory. We're, um, so, I mean, e e but you always have to include time because it keeps on piling them on. Each time you do it, it, it puts new values in. So uh, you either have to have time on, on an axis or, of course, have time sitting in the filter and pick just one of the times because it's going to aggregate them across time, which doesn't make sense at all in this particular case because it's, this is like a, like a warehouse type of situation where you're always snapshotting the current values of these, of these counters. Um, the other one is, again, which I think is really interesting, is to look at memory. I'm going to talk about memory a little bit later. Here's object memory non-shrinkable, object memory shrinkable. And then we pull out this parent-child dimension called memory object. And so we drill into our server and this databases. And we can see for each of our databases, maybe we can't see in the back very well, but we can see each of the databases how much memory is used, both non-shrinkable, meaning that the memory manager cannot easily reclaim it, and then the shrinkable, which means it's memory that the manager can, can throw away if it needs to uh, find more memory. And um, one, of, one of the things, of course, about analysis services, as you add additional databases onto your server, each of those databases, especially the dimensions in those databases, sucks up memory. And this tool allows you to see that very clearly, where all your memory is going. And so give that, uh, give that some thought. A nice new tool available from CodePlex. Oh, I see a few interesting characteristics. Let's just say about that is it joins, uh, the resource monitor joins all the tables through the time, through the, through the current time. So if you press the process, well, and, and, and it, it uses time by the minute. So uh, if you press process at uh, 
259.58, and it starts processing the cube, and some of the, and say the fact table gets loaded before it, it changes to the next minute, and the dimensions get loaded after it changes to the next minute, then the, the, uh, the processing fails. Or, or it can, it, sometimes it fails, or other times you get uh, uh, missing key errors, you know, because, because it's keying off of the time. And so, um, you know, it, it usually works, but then sometimes it doesn't work because the processing was done and, and, and went over the boundary of a minute. So a little bit of a bug there. Okay, another, um, another topic. Um, use the usage-based optimization wizard. Um, the usage-based optimization wizard did not work, did not work well, did not work in 2005. Now it does work in 2008. Microsoft uh, SQL CAT team has a, has a white paper out about that. Uh, we talk about that. These are results coming out of the white paper. Uh, usage-based optimization can be a very effective tool. Uh, not everybody is using it that should be using it. And so Microsoft encourages you to try it, and also to try it on a regular basis, because usage uh, patterns will vary over time. The cube structure changes over time, or the, the, the data in the cube has different characteristics over time. So using it repeatedly can keep the performance up. So simple, simple issue there. OK, monitoring memory usage. Uh, this is important. Um, because uh, memory problems can hurt both processing and can hurt uh, uh, query, perfor query performance. And, um, you know, there, there's two things about this in monitoring memory usage. In some cases, it just means you've got to have more memory. You've got to have more memory on your server if your analysis server database is going to work. You have to redesign your cube so it'll use less memory. Or you can do some changing of the memory options to try to make it work better with your existing structure and your existing resources. Now, the key value is, the, um, is to keep memory halfway between the low memory limit and the high memory limit. Now, those values are configurable. The low memory limit, by default, is set to 65% of the memory available on your server, high memory limit, uh, the default is, is 80%. Um, and that is, um, that's the total physical memory on the server for a 64-bit system. If it's a 32-bit system, which you're not supposed to use analysis services on 32-bit systems anymore. But if you are, then it's either 65 and 80% of 2 gigabytes or 3 gigabytes, depending on how that's set. 32-bit uh, analysis services cannot use more than 3 gigabytes of RAM. No matter what, no matter how much you have on your server. So, but 64 gigabytes, 64-bit uh, 64, 64 analysis services will use the 65 and the 80 percent. So, um, below the below the mid-memory level, very little cache data is dropped. Above this level, more and more is dropped. If the high memory level is exceeded, the analysis server has to take drastic actions to reduce memory. And those drastic actions, uh, while it's doing that, your server basically locks up. And uh, um, uh, here, here's, a, here's a chart in the performance monitor. You know, I saved, a, uh, again, here's the, the low limit, the high limit, and this is the actual amount of memory being used. So this is a, you know, if you have this kind of pattern, uh, this is all right. You know, so it, get, it did get above the, the mid. You know, the mid is, is halfway between the low and the high. It got above that for a little while. It, it uh, well, it did drop some memory. I say this is all right. This isn't exactly all right. It did drop some good memory there. It's all right if it stays below the mid level. You know, because it will drop a little memory, but it's usually memory that's not very useful. But when it gets above there, it starts dropping memory. I mean, this is a memory that you want to have in cache. This is your data cache. It's making your queries run fast. And so you, you don't want it to be dropped. But you really don't want the memory to get above the high limit, because then you start getting queries canceled, 
And again, the server looks like it's going to lock up. How, how long have you seen analysis server kind of sort of lock up from queries? Has anybody seen it lock up for an hour or become un unresponsive for an hour? Or? Anyway, nobody's seen that? OK, good. You maybe don't have a problem with this. Um, you know, it, it, can, it will happen, though. I mean, it will take a while uh, sometimes um, for it to come back. So some other things that you can monitor, let's see, I've got uh, um, the shrinkable memory. Um, that's the amount of memory that the server, the type of memory that uh, uh, can be shrunk. Uh, we have non-shrinkable memory. In this case, it's quite low. But, uh, oh yes, cleaner memory. This is, now here's the one I want. Cleaner memory shrunk. There's this right down here. So what happens is, is the memory got above the limit, and then it started reclaiming memory. It started dropping some of the data cache. And... Um, so it was able to get back down uh, below the low memory limit. We had um, one of our lab exercises involved starting um, uh, five queries and a processing operation at the same time. And here's what one of our students in Hong Kong, here's the results that he had when he ran these five queries in the processing operation. The memory usage shot way above the level, and uh, you know it, it tried to shrink some of the memory, but it couldn't shrink it fast enough. And that's and that's what the um, the developers at Microsoft, in explaining what happens with analysis services, you know, if you in in the SQL Server database in the, in the relational engine, um, the query analyzer or the, the optimizer is able to figure out how much memory is going to be needed by the query. And it's able to do that quite well. But analysis services, because cubes have so big of a space that they're being analyzed across, the query optimizer cannot figure out how much memory is going to be used until it actually starts running the query. And so if you have very intensive queries, the memory usage can shoot way above the amount of memory that really should be allowed to be used. And then the analysis server has to take drastic actions. And what it did at this point was it canceled half of the queries that were being run. And it just said, you know, memory pressure, we're going to cancel these queries. The other queries continued on and completed successfully. So this, this, uh, this student uh, for, the, for the lab, he went in then and modified some of the memory parameters, and he, the next time he ran it, he got a chart that looked like this. Um, the memory went up, it just touched the high limit, none of the queries were canceled, they all completed successfully. And the only change he made in the configuration is he dropped the lower memory limit down to 45%. So that the, there was a bigger gap, and so memory started to be dropped earlier on. And because it dropped memory earlier on, the server was able to survive and answer all the requests that were being made of it. Now the problem, of course, is as you lower the low memory limit, you're going to lose your data cache sooner. And you don't want to lose your data cache because data cache makes queries run fast. Um, but it's maybe better to lower the lower memory limit and um, um, have your queries be successful and keep your server from locking up rather than the other way around. Now there are a lot of other details about this. There's issues about whether you're running other, uh, other servers on the same box, whether you're running SQL Server on the same box as the analysis server. That means you have to set these, these, these configuration options differently. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about this. And it was one of the, you know, one of the interesting things that we were doing. I have a couple more just charts about this. Again, the default settings for analysis server, they have this thing called the memory price. It's all about money in analysis server. They got, they've got an initial balance, they got a price, they got a tax, and they got income. And this all gets calculated together to decide which memory structures are most valuable. Well, 
the price is zero until it reaches the low memory limit. At the mid memory limit, by default, the price is 10. And it rises uh, linearly from the low limit to the, lim to the mid level uh, from zero to 10. The high price default is 1,000. So starting with the mid level, the price goes up, the memory structures are taxed, which means that they'll be more likely to be discarded. That's, that's how we get rid of memory. We discard the ones that have a negative balance. So that's what I was saying is that if, if the memory use never gets above the mid, you'll see some memory being dropped, but you only see memory being dropped that really isn't very valuable. When you get over this, all of a sudden you start dropping a data cache that's actually being used by queries because it's, the price, is, price goes up so high that it starts getting, getting dropped out. Okay, monitoring memory, you can do use the task manager, the performance monitor, which of course gives you the most options, uh, the resource monitor. Uh, it's also important to look at hard faults, uh, you know, how much it's, it's paging, because um, uh, analysis server, that can really wreck analysis server's performance too if, 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 if it's paging things out to the disk. Um, analysis server, um, SQL Server modifies its behavior when it detects that it's paging its memory to the disk and will use less memory. The SQL Server Relational Database Engine, the analysis server does not. It does not know if it's paging. And so um, it can it con it'll continue to use whatever memory it can without paying attention to that. So you have to be more uh, proactive, more directive with analysis server in, in limiting the amount of memory that it, it will use. Okay, new topic. Larger partitions are okay and maybe even better. You'll get a warning in analysis server or you'll get a guide. Uh, it, it says that uh, uh, partitions should not be more than 20 million rows or 250 megabytes in size. Uh, current testing shows that that information is way out of date. Uh, much larger partitions work really well and uh, again there's a lot to be said about how to partition, how it affects processing, how it affects querying. It's very important with distinct count measures to partition correctly. There's a SQL CAD paper about that. Huge performance differences in partitioning with distinct count queries if you do it right. Uh, so normally partitioning can improve other query performance uh, even when there's not a distinct count involved. But normally, the partitioning is done more for the processing, to be able to divide processing out, uh, you know, to, to be able to process multiple partitions simultaneously. Okay, um, here's, here's, here's a tip, which again, uh, not many of us knew before we took this course. And that is that if you sort data when it's been entered, being, is entered into, being loaded into a partition, you can greatly improve performance. Either sorting it with a, with a, uh, a top count order by and a view, that you know, base, the, base the, uh, the partition off of a view, or just have it sorted in, um, you know, by using a clustered index in the relational database. Just have it, it, just have it sorted as it's being loaded in in, in, in chunks. What happens is that uh, rows are merged as they are um, uh, as they come in, in into the buffer during processing, so that uh, you can have three rows, and if they have identical keys, they will be merged into a single row, but only if they're in the in the merge buffer at the same time. So. Uh, Another thing about this is you can actually, there are configuration options, you can increase the size of the merge buffer if you have enough memory to do that. You can hurt it if you use too much memory, but if you have the memory, you increase the size of the buffer and the records can be consolidated more. This is especially important when you have a fact table with a very low level of grain, but your cube has a higher level of grain. So that multiple records can be combined into single records. If they're not in the same, if they're not in the merge buffer at the same time, then those identical records will be written multiple times to the disk. Um, Microsoft 
The SQL Cat team likes to talk about their Yahoo project where they have a cube. At past, they said the cube was 12 terabytes on disk, and now it's up to 18 terabytes. And they used this strategy with the Yahoo cube, and they were able to uh, cut the storage space in half, you know, just by getting things into the merge buffer at the same time. Very few analysis server folks know how to know that this is important to do. Here's another simple tip. Divide process full into process data and process index. Um, the process full command is, uh, you, can, you can do it in parts. You can process the data that's loading it in from SQL Server, process index, building the indexes and the aggregations inside of the analysis server. It's identical in what are the, uh, the you know, the one command equals the two commands. It does exactly the same thing. However, they've found that in many situations, dividing them uh, apart, they get better performance. And especially if you have multiple partitions that you run the process data all at the same time, the memory is used to load this data from the SQL Server, from the source relational database, and so uh, it can be processed, it can be loaded in together, it's in the memory, and then once it all gets loaded in, then you go ahead and do process indexes. Um, you really can get a boost from this if you have a situation which is uh, not real common, but common enough that it's good to mention it. If you have, if you have a SQL server that's only being used for data mart, you load the data into your data mart, you, then you process your cubes. And if they're on the same server, the SQL server and the analysis server, you might as well do, separate them out, use process data and process indexes, actually turn off the SQL server relational engine for when you're doing process indexes because SQL Server will keep some memory. And, you, and it's better to have all the memory available to the analysis server as it's doing process indexes. OK, next topic. And this is itself is a, a very long topic. And, uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it's good to be aware of the two ways query processor uh, evaluates the subspaces in the cube either by what's called naive or cell-by-cell -cell evaluation, or it's called subspace evaluation, block mode evaluation. Um, subspace evaluation is much more efficient and will be used whenever it can. Just uh, you know, explaining that, um, with cell-by-cell -cell mode, each cell is evaluated, the calculation is evaluated for each cell separately, such as you know, for adding the current in the previous month. The previous member function is used over a set of months. Each month is evaluated separately to find the previous month. And then the, and then the results are added together. But in subspace, a whole set of cells, it's like they can, they can take the whole set of cells and they can get the previous month for all of them as a single unit. And, uh, you know, obviously doing less work, doing it more quickly. And it, it's the biggest difference comes when there's a lot of null um, space in the, um, with, with a lot of empty space in, in the space that's being evaluated, when there are a lot of null cells. I've got an example of that, which, um, let's see. Oh, I've, I've actually got this set up over in the, um, the MDX Studio, which is a handy little tool. Uh, written by Moshe Passamansky, which we've been concerned was not going to be brought in the new version of SQL Server, but it appears now that it will be. So if I, if I clear the cache and I run this query, um, this first version of it, and it, it's, what it's doing, it's creating, a, it's, it's creating a set called postal code areas, each of the members of the geography for each postal code. And then it's going to sum them. Uh, if they're over 10,000, then it's considered to be a high value area. So we're summing that. We're dividing by the internet sales amount and so forth. So what, what all do we get? We get the, the percent of sales that were made in high value areas. OK, this query took four seconds. Sales calculated 1,303,000. 
because it calculated all of the null space. We were going over the non-empty calendar year. We were taking all the calendar years by all the individual product members from AdventureWorks. And it was 1,303,000 cells. If we do a very simple change in this query, instead of having a set defined up on top, we take the, uh, the definition of that set and we inline it right into the calculation, the calculated member. Uh, exactly the same thing. Let's see, I do need to clear the cache, of course. This, by the way, is just the analysis server cache. It's not the file system cache. I uh, can't do that from inside this tool. So then I run the query a second time, and the result is one second. But what's really key here is there were 32 cells calculated, from 1.3 million down to 32 cells, because it used block mode calculation. And so this, I mean, this is just one of the rules. Using a set, using a set here in the query, defining the set, um, blocked or disabled the block mode calculation. And uh, there, are, there are a number of other things. Um, here, here is a list of them using a set alias. Uh, that it, we should, it shouldn't really say a set, it should just say using a set. All, using a set in almost every case will block um, the, will, will stop the block mode computation or the subspace computation. Using late binding in a function, that is, uh, the, where the function cannot know the value it's going to, to, to deliver until it actually looks at the particular row that it's come to. Um, using lookup cube, people don't use that very much. Using user-defined dot net or com store procedures. This is very unfortunate because, of course, you can extend analysis services to use your own calculations, your own functions, but they all perform poorly because you can never use block mode computation with it. Custom rollup, forward reference, and MDX script. And then there's, you know, you can see the full list in, in books online. And that's the end. Look at that. What, what does this say anyway? That's, that's, um, so I, I finished quarter after four. My goodness, a lot of time for questions.